2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1. Our text will be verse 14, but let's read through the passage very quickly. Verse 1, 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning uh, the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, with persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And here is our text tonight. But continue thou in the things which thou hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I would like to speak tonight on the subject, but continue thou. But continue thou. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the preaching that we heard just a moment ago. May we with integrity and intensity from your Holy Spirit go from this conference to slay the giants, to see the greater works. Now, Lord, in these final moments of our first evening, speak to our hearts. Help us to continue. Help us to go forward with faith. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The second book of Timothy is often referred to as the Apostle Paul's last will and testament. You perhaps already know that Paul the Apostle wrote this book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit from what is known as the Mamertine prison in the city of Rome. It was here in this prison that the Apostle Paul was kept. It was from this prison he was led to his death as a martyr for the Christian faith. During this particular period of time, around 64 AD, Nero, the Roman emperor, had caused much difficulty for Christians throughout the known world. The Apostle Paul, as he was in this prison, is writing to those Christians and challenging Timothy in particular that he would stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Nero's hatred for the Christians was so well known that we, are, that we read in history, according to the Roman historian Tacitus, that Nero, after burning the city of Rome, blamed the Christians, causing more persecution to come upon the Christians in the latter portion of the first century. Paul is writing to those believers, and I believe looking ahead and challenging us as well, when he says in verse number 11, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul is writing about the last days about the evil men, the seducers, that will bring deceit into the world. In fact, he begins chapter 3 with these words, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. 
The word perilous speaks of a continual slacking or unraveling. What he's saying is that things are going to fall apart in the last days. Families are going to fall apart and, and uh, there's going to be difficulty in the land and persecution that comes uh, to the way of the church. And we'll not go through all of them, but Paul gives 18 characteristics of the last days. And when you read verses 1 through 12, he doesn't paint a very pretty picture. He says, uh, in the latter days there will be selfishness and there will be rebelliousness. Uh, there will be uh, men uh, uh, without natural affection. And we see the sin of homosexuality plaguing America, plaguing Asia, even today. Paul said these things are going to be on the rise throughout the world in the latter times. He said there will be disrespect, false accusers, despisers of those that are good. He says there will be lovers of pleasure uh, more than lovers of God. And the Apostle Paul says in the latter times before Jesus comes, there's going to be an unraveling of many different things that once were held together. And so he says perilous times will come. And I want you to notice as he concludes these thoughts, coming to verse number 12, that there is a prophecy of corruption that is made. The Apostle Paul makes a prophecy in verse 12, and he says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's as if in this chapter there is a backdrop that is given, and the backdrop is very dark and black and bleak. And, and he says all of these unravelings are going to happen. And he says because of that, if you intend to stand up for what is right, there will come persecution into your life. There will come difficulty into your life. All that will to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He says the godly will suffer. Now someone says, Brother Chapel, you came all the way to the Philippines to say that to us. How many of you understand that oftentimes before we can really appreciate the good news, we've got to understand the real situation? And he says, I want you to know there's going to be an unraveling in the last days. And for those who intend to stay bound to Jesus Christ, there is going to come persecution and difficulty in their lives. And, and we see it, folks. We see it uh, all around the world today. We hear of the rise of ISIS and we see the beheadings of Christians on television. And we hear about those who mock preaching and the preaching of the Bible and those who hate uh, the fact that we would stand up and proclaim truth of the word of God and there is much animosity in the world today and God says there will be suffering in fact in Acts 14 and 22 the Bible says confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we through much tribulation must enter in to the kingdom of God the Bible tells us that in the world we shall have tribulation by the way it also says that we're to be of good cheer because he has overcome the world amen God says that the godly will suffer. And then he tells us that the weak and unbelieving in this period of unraveling are going to be deceived. And I believe he's speaking here uh, about uh, a period of time prior to the coming of the Lord uh, when there uh, is a great delusion that comes across the world and people are turning away from God. And while the reference may be to the unsaved who will ultimately accept the Antichrist, I believe the spirit of unbelief is affecting the church as well. And notice what he says about this in verse number 13. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Notice the term waxing worse and worse. It will continue to increase. And we see it today in the secular colleges of our countries, uh, how that the professors are waxing worse and worse as they make fun of Christianity and they question the inerrancy of the Bible. And as they attack the Christian faith, we see it in the United States of America with our Supreme Court legalizing same-sex marriage. And we see that evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. And it seems like they're just having their way at every turn. And, and then the Bible tells us that this uh, will continue on as they deceive and as they continually bring about a spirit of deception. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2, that ye be soon not shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. 
A time does not permit tonight, but there will be an unraveling of things precious, an unraveling in the world of dignity and morality, and evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, and this will only prepare the way for the son of perdition or the Antichrist who will seemingly be the answer man to all of the world, and as pluralism abounds in the world, and as people will say, listen, all the faiths are about the same, and, and we ought to just all come together as this spirit of apostasy and and people turn away from the truth and the unraveling of the church. The Bible tells us that the spirit of deception will fall right into the hands of the Antichrist who will begin to have his way. May I say that those days are upon us. May I say the day of deception has come. May I say the day of persecution has come. And it's not just in America, it's around the world. Cult leaders, even in this country, men that proclaim themselves to be the very Son of God. How, how much debauchery can we stand and heresy can we hear? Uh, evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse, going from door to door with their briefcase and their watchtower, saying that Jesus is not the Son of God and claiming themselves to be be gods uh, and saying that they as men have become gods and by the way we do not believe that Jesus Christ was a man who became God he is eternal God and he is God who took the form of a man in order that we might be saved but evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse and and we need to recognize that deception notice it says in verse number 13 deceiving and being deceived I was over in Thailand a few Decades ago, and we were preaching a three-day meeting in Thailand. We were going to Singapore after that. On the way to the airport, the missionary said, you want to pull over here, and you can maybe get a few souvenirs and so forth. And we went in, and a friend of mine was standing there looking at some products, and a man came up to him with a little leather-looking briefcase, and he opened it up, and it was full of watches. And he said, hey, want to buy a Rolex? He said, $5. $5. $5. And uh, I'd, I'd seen something like this before, but my friend hadn't seen it before, and he began to look at those Rolexes. And that man began to say, these have Swiss movement. These are great. Five dollars. Only five dollars. Guarantee. Five dollars. Guarantee. My friend was so excited to buy a Rolex. He said, I heard you could get deals over here. I had no idea they were this good. <laughs> Boy, he got that Rolex. He was so happy to have it. He kept looking at it, talking about it, and showing, showing me his watch. And we were just having a good time. And and uh, we got on the plane. We were heading over to Singapore. And just for fun, I started playing around. I said, I said, hey, Jim. I said, what time is it? He said, uh, it's 10 o'clock. I said, oh, great. After a little while longer, I said, hey, Jim, what time is it? He said, it's 10 o'clock. <laughs> a little while longer, I said one more time, hey, Jim, what time is it? He said, shut up. <laughs> Evil men and seducers show wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived and I want you to understand it's one thing to be deceived about a Rolex watch it's another thing to be deceived about heaven and hell and we have them all around the 1040 window saying that there's no need for Jesus Christ. There's no real heaven. There's no real hell. And I want you to recognize tonight that God has given to us the truth of the Word of God. And we are to hold forth the Word of life. And we are to speak the truth that there is none other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. In this day of unraveling truth, God says, I need my church to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. And so we see today the spirit of apostasy. And yes, it's affecting the church. We see many times in our country the effects of that Revelation 3 Laodicean church. The word Laodicea means the people's rights. I say it again. The word Laodicea means the church of the people's rights. And I want to simply say tonight, the church is not the communities and the church does not belong to the people. I want you to understand that we are purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you better be careful when you start worrying about the people's rights and what do the teenagers want in the church and what kind of music do the teenagers want and what about that rich guy? I don't want to offend him. And what about my wife? And what about this one and that one? Hey, it's not up to the congregation to decide. It's the word of God that must prevail. We ought not build our church based upon what people want. There is one who shed his blood for the church. 
years ago, I got a thing in the mail and it said, come to our seminar, we'll teach you how to build your church. And it said, we'll teach you how to go from house to house and ask people, what kind of a church do you want? And you can ask people, what kind of a, do they want preaching? Do they want to have an offering, yes or no? Do they want to have what kind of music? And then after you figure out what the people want, you can establish a church that way so that everybody can come. It's kind of like a demographics or a marketing. Come to our seminar. We'll teach you how to do that. I wasn't really that old at the time. I looked at that piece of mail and I thought to myself, since when do you go to the unsaved man and ask him what kind of church he wants? And we need some preachers today that will get into the book of Acts and find out what kind of church Jesus wants and go out into your community and give them what God wants them to have. And so we see that in these latter times, there's a prophecy of corruption. Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. But notice secondly tonight, the priority of continuing. The priority of continuing. Verse 14, but, but, all of this unraveling will happen, Timothy. Listen, preacher, Paul says, there's going to be all kinds of unraveling in the culture around us, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Now, I'm going to tell you honestly, I've pastored the same church for 30 years. And I wake up oftentimes and I, I read the newspaper and I hear the news and I hear about all of the unraveling, the perilous times. I hear about the divorce rate and the abortion rate and the homosexuality rate and I hear about the suicide rate and I hear about the runaway rate and the, the drug problems and I, I hear about all of the liberalism in the land and sometimes as a preacher, I don't even know what to do next. I don't know what to preach next. I don't know what program to start next. It sometimes is overwhelming. And God, I believe, touched my heart in a special way as I read this verse. And the fact of the matter is, I don't have to start anything new. And I don't have to learn anything new. What I've got to do is what God told me to do back when He called me to preach. I've just got to be faithful to continue in those things that I know to be right. Continue thou. The priority of continuing. You say, well, we're waiting for the Lord to return, and that's a wonderful thing. But what are we going to do between now and then? How will we continue between now and then? Oh, you see, keeping the faith is what God has called us to do, and yet we must recognize that there's a great tendency as we wait for the Lord to return, there will be one of two directions happen in your ministry. You will either continue going forward in soul winning, continue going forward in missions, or you'll begin to drift from your mission. You will either with intentionality go from the Bible to obedience, from the Bible to obedience, or subtly and slowly you will drift from your mission. God gives us our mission. We are to continue on faithfully for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, so many churches today are so concerned about relevance and they're so relevant you can't tell a difference between the church and the world today. We don't need something new. We need to be faithful to what God has already once delivered to His saints. We must continue with our biblical mission. You see, the men and women who have changed the world are the men and women the world could not change. God is looking for men who will stay true to the Word of God, who will continue in the faith once delivered unto the saints. And so we see that there must be a continuance. And I want to challenge you with the priority of continuing tonight. First of all, we must continue in biblical truth. Notice the Bible says in verse number 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of. Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, 16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in them oh listen it's a privilege to preach heaven sweet and hell hot and Jesus coming again it's a privilege to preach the promises of the word of God and the doctrine of the church and the doctrine of the second coming and the doctrine of the deity of Jesus Christ and God says I need my men to continue in the truth I want you to preach the doctrine of Jesus Christ 1 Timothy 1 and 15 this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief I've got to tell you something. I've been preaching the Word of God now for 34 years. I still get excited about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful privilege to stand up and preach the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing to preach that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And what a privilege when someone comes and trusts Christ as their Savior. Oh, we must continue with preaching Jesus Christ this past Christmas, the Christmas 
mass was given and the Pope issued his Christmas message. In the Pope's Christmas message, he was speaking from the central balcony of St. Peter's Basilica, speaking about the need for mercy in the world. That's fine. But he said to all of the Catholics who will spread mercy in the world, he will offer to them a plenary indulgence. An indulgence is an ancient church tradition that simply means some of your sins are going to get forgiven. And if you study a plenary indulgence, he literally was telling them that they would spend a little less time in the in-between place. If they would just do these things he was telling them to do. Now there's two problems with that. Number one, there is no purgatory. And number two, God never ordained a pope. And the pope cannot give indulgences or the forgiveness of sin. I want to tell you there is one God. And there is one mediator between God and man. And it is the man, Christ Jesus. And it is the blood of Jesus Christ that it was shed for our sin. And I want you to understand. And always keep the joy in preaching Christ. And always be excited about the fact that Jesus Christ is the virgin born son of God. And that he lived a perfectly sinless life. And that he was tempted in all points like as we are. Yet without sin he went to the cross of Calvary. And there the Roman soldiers put the nails through his hands and the nails through his feet and the crown of thorns upon his head and the blood was shed and without the shedding of the blood there is no remission of sin and thank God though he was placed in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea on the third day up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph or his foes hey I don't need some new program I don't need some new message tonight I've already got what excites me it's the gospel of Jesus Christ God says, I want you to continue preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The doctrine of Christ must be continued. Then secondly, I believe we need to continue the doctrine of the church. Jesus said, thou art Peter, little rock. Thou art the little rock. But upon this rock, I will build my church. I got a thing in the mail the other day. It said, Come to our seminar. We'll teach you how to reinvent church. We don't need to reinvent what God invented. We just need to work God's plan. We just need to get back to God's way. 1 Timothy 3.15 But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Of the house of God which is the church of the living God. The pillar and the ground of the truth. Do you understand what a privilege it is just to be the church. Just to be the under shepherd under the chief shepherd. And just to stand up in a community and lift high the truth of the blood atonement. And lift high the truth of eternal security. And lift high the truth of heaven for all of eternity. And God says there's a lot of cities and there's a lot of villages. And there's a lot of entire countries that don't have anyone lifting up the truth. And God put you where you are to lift that truth up. Oh, listen, it's a great joy to serve in the local New Testament Baptist church. The doctrine of Christ must continue. And the doctrine of the church must continue. And may I say, not only the doctrine of Christ and the church, but may I say the discipleship of the believers must continue. Tomorrow we'll speak in the sessions about how to help people that are newly saved to to become discipled and faithful members. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2 and 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Hey, the fact of the matter is that every pastor here is an interim pastor. Sometimes people say, well, our other pastor left, so I'm the interim pastor. We're, I'm, I'm here as the interim pastor for they mean by that for a time till the next pastor comes. Do you know that every pastor is an interim pastor? What is your life? It's but a vapor. You're here for a while and then vanish away. Every one of us better be training our replacement. Hey, it's not about my little kingdom. It's not about my little empire. It's not about me. It's not to be a man-centered ministry. The church is the church of the living God. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us must train our replacement. The things that thou hast heard of me, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. About a year and a half ago, I was standing in the back of our church shaking hands after church, and a very sharp couple came up and shook my hand, very nicely dressed, and I said, we're glad you're here today, and, and uh, I said uh, to them, I couldn't tell if they were Hispanic or Middle Eastern, I couldn't tell where they were from. I said, do you mind if I ask where are you folks from? They said, we're from Iran. I said, oh, that's great. I said, how long have you been in our country? They said, one day. One day. 
if you've read the news, Iran is not really our best friend. Our, our president doesn't understand that. That's another message I can't get into right now. But. I said to them, Dr. Kim, how did you get here from Iran? They said, oh, we were on vacation in Switzerland. We went to the U.S. Embassy. We said we want to visit our relative in America. One hour later, we were going to the airport to come to America. Amazing. People spend their lives to do this. And one hour later, from Iran, they came to America. They come to America. They visit their uncle, whose son, three weeks earlier, in one of our public school Bible clubs, had accepted Christ as Savior. And this boy says to them, I'm glad you're here. Come to church with me tomorrow. And so on their first day in America, they went to an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist church. <laughs> he said to me, he said, I grew up in school. Every day we said three things. We hate America. We hate Jesus. And we hate Israel. He said, I grew up saying that every day. And then he said, but really? I never knew why I hated America, and I don't know why I would hate Jesus. You made him sound to like a wonderful man today. On Tuesday night, soul winning, one of our associate pastors led that man to Christ. We knew he was just there for a little while, so we brought him through our continued discipleship program. We enrolled him in a one-year Bible program at our college. We did everything we could to disciple him. I brought a man in who's a missionary to the Muslims to teach him how to witness to Muslims. We just poured our heart and life into this man, teaching him and training him. And finally the day came, several months later, he said, I must go. My visa has expired. I must go. We had prayer with him. He said, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be a missionary to my country. He was on the plane, and I figured I would not hear from him much because of the monitoring of the computers and all of those things, and, and sure enough, I didn't hear much at all from him until four weeks ago when I saw him at the back of the church on a Sunday night. It was one of those services where I didn't feel like I'd preached that well and didn't feel like the day went that great, and I was kind of walking out just tired acting and feeling, and I looked up, and there he was, and he came, and he gave me a big hug, Pastor. Pastor, I've missed you. I said, how did you get here? He said, well, you know, your president lifted the sanctions on our country. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> I said, that's another sermon. <laughs> and there's only one reason that that's good in my mind right now, and that's because this new Christian got to come and see me. He was buying some equipment for his company. We went and had a dinner together. I said, tell me, how's it going? How's it going in Iran? He said, oh... People are so afraid when we just say the name Jesus. They put their head down. They look to see who's listening. They're afraid. But he said, Pastor, my mother wasn't afraid. She got saved. And my father wasn't afraid. He got saved. And my brother got saved. And he said, Pastor, I've witnessed to 1,000 people in Iran. I may never go to Iran. There may never be missionaries supported and sent to Iran in the traditional sense. But the fact of the matter is that every one of us, when we disciple a believer so that they can teach others also, we can send missionaries to the uttermost part of the earth. God would not command us to do something that is impossible. If we will just win, baptize, and disciple converts, He will send them to the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, we must, in biblical truth, continue teaching the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of discipleship. And then notice it says in verse 14 something familiar and something important. He says, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Notice this phrase, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He said, now, Timothy, you know the truth is from Christ but you also have been taught you had a godly mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice. They lived the life before you. They taught you the word of God, 2 Timothy 1, 5. He said, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which was first in thy mother, Lois, and thy grandmother, Eunice. He said, now, I want you to continue in the things you learned from mom and dad, uh, uh, from your mom and grandmother. I want you to continue in the things that I taught you concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And every one of us from time to time ought to stop and thank God for those who led us to Christ and those who discipled us and those who loved us and those who helped us along in the ministry. May I say to you, 
You may have even had a mentor that was unfaithful to God and that fell out of the ministry, but you ought to still be thankful that they led your sorry soul to Christ. You ought to be thankful for whatever good they did in your life. I visited several churches Saturday. One church said, oh, we're so thankful for the Woosleys. And one said, we're so thankful uh, for the Hoagies and the Lions. And one said, oh, is Bob Hughes this and that? And listen, it might be someone else, and it might be someone from China or the Philippines or Cambodia. I don't know who's invested in your life, but I'm going to tell you something. You ought to continue in the truth that they once taught you. We're not here these few days to try to conjure up something new. We're here to say, continue. Continue in the truth of the Word of God. Don't throw away the truth that has been once delivered unto the saints. We must continue in the truth. We must uh, continue in constant remembrance of those uh, that have taught us. Thirdly, we must continue with holy persistence for the Lord going on. Not drifting, but persistent going on forward for the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2 and 1, Paul said, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the faith that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. And there are some days when you may want to quit, but the Holy Spirit of God says, Keep going. You may not feel like going soul winning. Keep going. You may not feel like confronting that problem in the church, but you've got to keep going. And Paul says, continue on, Timothy. Keep on going. Don't quit. Be faithful. I have a dear friend and mentor in the United States named Dr. Bobby Robertson. Brother Bobby Robertson would be now, I'd say, about in his mid-80s. He's pastored Gospel Light Baptist Church in North Carolina for nearly 50 years. When he was 29 years old, He'd been working so hard and soul winning and doing the work of God to a point that he came to physical complete exhaustion. He had a nervous system just break down type of thing where he had anxiety and nerves and it became so debilitating he had to go to the hospital. 29 years old, he laid in the hospital there and they thought he had heart problems, they thought other problems existed. One day the Sunday school superintendent and a couple of deacons came to visit the pastor. And they actually said to him, Pastor, it seems that it ought to be obvious to you as it is to us that God's done with you. And if you don't get out of here soon, we're going to start looking for a new pastor. That next Sunday, Brother Bobby Robertson came to his church and he didn't have much strength, but he put up a little chair and he sat in the chair and he, he taught what he could teach for about 10 minutes. And on Sunday night, he taught again for about 10 minutes. He went back to bed, and he got back up the next week, and he taught for about 12, and the next week for about 15. And he rested, and he did all that he could, and he just kept giving the Word of God. God began to restore his strength, and they moved from this little 80-seat auditorium to a 1,000-seat auditorium, and from the 1,000-seat auditorium to the 3,000-seat auditorium, and from no buses to one bus to 10 buses to 50 buses to a first gymnasium to a second gymnasium to a dining hall uh, to a, a grave site for the members of the church that had gone to be with the Lord, and they continued to develop 10 acres and 80 acres and 100 acres, and I'm here to tell you, the men said that God was done with him, but God's not done with you until God says he's done with you God says I want you to continue I want you to continue on persistently here we see the prophecy of corruption yes things are unraveling but we see the priority of continuing we must continue faithful for the Lord and notice finally tonight the pathway to conquest there is a pathway to victory in this dark day it is possible that we can see the victory that comes from the word of God Notice, if you would, the Bible tells us how in verse number 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. May I say tonight that a biblical mindset is more powerful than the culture all around us. Brother Farrell could not have been more correct, accurate, truthful when he drew our attention to an intimate walk with God, to spending time alone with God. And, and the world rushes on, but we must take time to be holy. We must take time with the Lord in prayer and in the Word of God. And yes, uh, there's a lot of unraveling that goes on, but you don't have to unravel. There's a lot of falling apart in the world, but God can keep you together by His Word. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. I want you to see very quickly tonight, the Scriptures are profitable. 
They're profitable for your family, for your church. The Bible is clear. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. This God-breathed book, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And God says, hey, I know things are unraveling, but I've got some glue to keep you together. I've got a way to hold you together. And the way I'll hold you together is through my word. The way he'll hold the church together is through the preaching of the word. That's why God said to Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Hey, we've got to have strong preaching of the word of God. And I'm not talking about preaching about preaching. And I'm not talking about preaching about current events. And I'm not talking about preaching about whatever we feel like preaching about. I'm talking about preaching the word of God. Line by line, principle by principle, expounding the wonderful truths of the Word of God. Why? Because they are profitable. They are profitable for doctrine, uh, for the building up of the truth in the church. They are profitable for reproof, uh, that is, uh, uh, for correcting those things uh, that are wrong. You see, we must open the Word of God and receive the correction and the instruction that comes. This book from which I preach today is the mind of God. It shows the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers, its doctrines are holy, its precepts are true uh, and binding, and its direction and decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise and believe it to be safe and practice it to be holy. You can't live without the Word of God. The Scriptures are profitable. May I say, secondly, the Scriptures are powerful. I told you before, sometimes I don't know how to be a very good pastor. I don't even know what to preach about. It's overwhelming sometimes all of the social media and the technology and the sin that gets into people's lives and we, we didn't even know it was there. But I'm glad that I can stand up and preach from an eternal book written by a holy God. I'm thankful that this book is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And when I don't even know what's going on in the lives of the church, that if I'll just stand up and preach this book, God will tell them what they need to hear. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And that old demon and that old devil's coming in and he's trying to discourage your deacon. And he's trying to ruin your teenager. And he's trying to break marriages. And you don't even know what's going on. But God knows what's going on. And he gave us an eternal book that will touch and change hearts and lives. If we'll just preach the word of God. Oh, I love watching the Bible change people's lives. Oh, that's exciting to me. I got a Christmas card a few weeks back from a little girl, eight years old. She said, Dear Pastor, Thank you for this church and your preaching. I know you work very hard to do this stuff. She said, we are very happy to have you here. This year my dad learned not to drink and smoke and how to be nice. I wish some preachers would learn that. Either one of the three, drink and smoking or being nice. Just start with one of them tonight. You say, man, I bet it's pretty nice to travel all around and preach and do these different things like this. I'll tell you what's pretty nice, getting letters like that from Anna. I'll tell you what's pretty neat, seeing God change someone's life. Years ago, my daughter Danielle and I went out soul winning on a Saturday morning. A man had visited our church, filled out a card, and we knocked on his door doing a follow-up call. And we heard the loud rock music playing. And he brought us into the house. He had long hair, had an earring in his ear. I thought he was a hippie. I found out later he's an air traffic controller. That was a scary thought. (laughs) I said, John, we're glad you came to our church last week. I said, I'd like to ask you a question. If you were to die today, would you spend eternity in heaven or in hell or do you know? He said, you know, you asked that question at church last Sunday. I don't really know. I said, the Bible says you can know, John. I said, can I take a few moments and show you from the Bible how you could know? He said, sure. Boy, I opened up the Word of God, and about 30 minutes later, he prayed and trusted Christ as his Savior. 
He came to church the next Sunday morning. Next Sunday night, he got baptized Sunday night. He was standing out there in the foyer of the church. His long hair was dripping wet. I said, John, why don't you go with me tomorrow night? I'm preaching down in the Los Angeles area. You can come with me and, and we'll, uh, we'll just spend some time together. He said, you want me to go with you? I said, sure. You need to hear the hymns of our faith and preaching of the word of God. That next night, I pulled up in front of his house about 5 o'clock. I honked the horn and a strange man walked out of his house. There was a hole in his ear where there used to be an earring. There was a haircut that would pass Bible college standards. I had on a pair of slacks and a sport coat. He had on a three-piece suit. He got in my car. He said, hi, pastor. I got a new Bible today. It's the King George version. Did I get the right one? I said, you got it right the first time. You say, what program did you put him through? What class was he in? My friend, when you combine the power of the Word of God with the presence of the Holy Spirit, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Oh, I'm telling you tonight, the Scriptures are profitable. The Scriptures are powerful. The Scriptures are provisional. Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In other words, the Word of God is our equipment. It helps us. Uh, it is what we need to go out and build. Uh, and we're not going to build in the power of the flesh. But if we build with the Word of God, we will build strong churches. And my friend, it doesn't matter if it's in Laos or Sri Lanka or in the Philippines. The Word of God. God will build the church. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Sometimes people tell me, oh, it's hard to build a church in California. It's hard to build a church in New York. Oh, it's hard in Manila. It's hard here. It's hard there. I've got to tell you something. We've got a chisel. I mean, we've got dynamite. I mean, we've got a powerful message, and it doesn't matter what city you preach it in. The Word of God can carve out a church in that city. Powerful, wonderful truth of the Word of God. Paul said, Timothy, I'm about to go home. This is my last will and testament. Perilous times are coming. Things are going to unravel. But continue. You remember what I taught you. You remember what your mother taught you. You remember the source of that teaching was the Word of God. And you continue in the things that you have learned and have been assured of. Tonight there is a simple question for you. Are you drifting? Or are you continuing? Are you just going with the culture? Or are you continuing with the word of God? Many of you could tell this story better than I. The end of World War II. Not far from here at the rock island of Corregidor. One of our United States generals was kept there, General Wainwright. General Wainwright had become very discouraged as a prisoner of war. The Japanese were cruel taskmasters. It was a difficult time. He wondered if he would ever make it home. Finally, he got to the place where he stopped eating. He stopped shaving. He gave up hope. One night... He heard just a little whisper, just a little whisper. General MacArthur had sent some of his crack troops to scale the walls of Corregidor and to come into the area where General Wainwright was kept. They said, General, General MacArthur sent us to tell you the war is almost over. We're about to win the war. You'll be out soon. The next morning, General Wainwright got up. He snapped to attention. He told his captors, I'll have my soup today. He took his toothbrush and began to brush his medals and polish his medals. He did his best to brush his teeth and brush off his uniform. And he began to command for his food. And he began to exercise. And something had come over him. And what had come over him was the fact that he had heard the good news that General MacArthur was coming. And so he decided to continue on as a soldier of the United States of America. And my friend, may we never forget that soon the trump of God will sound. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we which are alive and remain will join them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. Wherefore, comfort one another with 
with these words, ladies and gentlemen, the king is coming. It's not time to quit. It's not time to drift. It's time to continue for the Lord Jesus Christ. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. 